This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today is Steve Kokinos. Steve is the CEO at Algorand. Algorand is an open, permissionless, pure proof-of-stake blockchain protocol that wants to usher in a new era of serious DeFi. Hey, welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks so much for having me, Andy. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, hey, I think the best thing to do is, why don't we just start at the beginning? Why don't you just introduce yourself and, and perhaps share a, a little bit of your personal story and, and your background and, and what led you to your current role as CEO at Algorand? Yeah, sure. So um, let's see. Uh, I started... Uh, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I started uh, my first company when I was uh, around 19 and still in college. Uh, so it was mid 90s, back in the early days of the internet, uh, and thought that um, you know the underpinnings of, of the tech there were really fascinating. And uh, you know, actually, I think there's a lot of similarities to went on in those early days in the internet, um, as early days of, uh, of crypto and blockchain. So uh, you know, that, that's one of the things that attracted me for sure. Um, went on to build one of the early uh, internet infrastructure businesses um, we built data centers around the world and then uh, sold that business in 2000 uh, in 2001 I co-founded a company called blade logic with um, several other people uh, which really had the aim of automating a lot of the manual day-to-day uh, -day work that goes on in data centers and, and with systems um, and uh, ultimately blade logic went public and was then sold to BMC software uh, for about 800 million dollars and uh, for sort of the intervening decade uh, after that, I started and, and ran a company called Fuse, uh, which is a uh, telephony and collaboration business um, focused on uh, bigger enterprises. You know, Fuse is about a uh, 600 person business today and um, um, doing very well. And, you know, I, as I kind of uh, transitioned out of running that business day to day, uh, I had become interested in crypto um, through some friends who are early Bitcoin miners, um, started to, you know, look at the technology, ended up setting up some miners with my kids in uh, in the basement of our house and, and just started learning about it and, and thought that, you know, the possibilities uh, were really fascinating and the tech was, uh, was really innovative. And it was, for me, the most dynamic thing I had seen um, really since the early days of the internet um, in the, the intervening 20 years. And the thing that felt the most similar just in terms of, of uh, kind of excitement and you know, possibilities uh, and was fortunate um, through uh, Pillar and Union Square Ventures to get introduced to Silvio uh, and um, you know, thought Silvio's both ideas for Algorand and just sort of his general body of work were, were really fascinating. And, and um, I think we had some really interesting discussions and uh, started to get more involved in the project. So it's been uh, a really uh, interesting adventure so far. Fantastic. And so well, well, tell us a, a little bit about that uh, early part of you joining the company then and, and deciding to work with Silvio and, and, and work on the project. And tell us a, a little bit about, you know, the the background or, or the origin story to Algorand and, you know, what what is the problem that you're seeking to solve? Yeah. So why don't I start with, uh, with that because it really predates my involvement. Um, so... You know, Silvio uh, found or, you know, was introduced to Bitcoin, you know, very early and thought that it represented both um, a really fascinating use of cryptography uh, as well as distributed computer science. Um, but also, you know, when he looked at kind of the way it was architected with the need for mining and the electrical consumption and computational consumption um, coupled with, uh, you know, relatively low performance felt that, you know, if you were really going to design um, a platform that the entire world could use and could really replace physical money um, that there was you know, just sort of some fundamental computer science um, uh, or fundamental elements of, of computer science that needed to be tackled. Uh, you know, as an example, um, the Byzantine agreements uh, that have been you know, out for a couple of decades hadn't really been tackled. Algorand is a new form of Byzantine agreement. And so um, what Silvio did was he worked with, you know, a number of other researchers uh, at MIT and elsewhere and uh, came up with the idea of Algorand and published uh, the theory behind it as an academic paper. 
um, which was peer reviewed and uh, 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 and then published by uh, or uh, where he presented the ACM and you know ultimately got a lot of uh, I think really positive attention um, for that and that was I believe around 2015 um, and so you know over time you know started to think about it more and and you know he got to a point in 2017 where it felt like it made sense to um, spin Al Grand out as a, a project on its own right um, you know separate from his work at MIT uh, and you know kind of early days i originally joined um kind of co-investing and uh with uh union square and pillar and and uh joined the board and then you know as i spent more time i thought you know just the, the possibilities uh you know and the possibilities uh, to really kind of reshape the way people use money and the way people think about um you know think about the way they exchange value and transact with each other um were really fascinating and endless and and um it got me really excited and uh you know just started spending more and more time so it's it's um you know i, I think the the origin is actually as fascinating here as uh the story itself because you know really i think it's one of the few projects that has developed uh all of its own tech sort of from the ground up and is new code base and really new elements of, of new fundamental elements of computer science that uh, have been Yes, indeed. I, I think that's uh, that's nicely said, Steve. And you know, I can think of uh, there's a lot of different projects. Algorand is certainly one of them, and I think Algorand's a, a really good example of a, a project that has, you know, really, really interesting and and solid tech. I mean, I'm I'm not a super technical guy myself, but you know, I understand that the the, the tech is, is solid. Uh, you know. From a computer science point of view, I suppose, uh, but of course, you know, the it's one thing to have, uh, you know, second or, or third generation blockchain technology, but it's another thing, of course, to to get adoption and use happening. And look, we'll talk more about that. But one of, one of the analogies that I like that I have seen your team talk about is, you know, the idea that something like AWS. In the same way that AWS has made cloud computing, you know, super accessible and easy to use for a, a, essentially a, a global user base, you know, I think that's the goal of projects such as Algorand. You know, you want to do something similar in terms of building out an ecosystem for, let's say, for DeFi or the exchange of value or or whatever it is, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think we've seen in a lot of other areas that there's, you know, network effects to be had um, when you start to, you know, bring in uh, new user bases, new users to a community. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about um, are, you know, what sort of tools, uh, what sort of even things like how to's and developer materials uh, do we need to bring out into the market? Um, partly to attract the hundred or hundred thousand or so developers that build on blockchain today, um, but more specifically to attract the, you know, 20 million or so that aren't really building uh, using blockchains today. And I think that, that, you know, really success here is, is going to be um, bringing, you know, new entrants into the market and, you know, not just the, the you know, same people who've been around. Uh, I think we've got good signs that that's, uh, that's starting to happen. And, um, you know, some of the applications we see deploying are really new user bases to crypto. Um, and I think like AWS, our, you know, our view on Algorand is that um, there's going to be a handful of, of uh, platforms and public networks that people use for different purposes um, that can be winners here. Um, and I think most other tech waves have seen, you know, the, that where there's multiple technologies that people adopt that, that really form the basis of it. Um, but, you know, today, fast forward, um, to where we are, when you fire up Netflix uh, or Spotify, um, there isn't a logo that says AWS is powering them behind the scenes, but it doesn't make AWS any less powerful um, or successful. And I think that's how we think about Algorand is really how do we become a utility that other people can use uh, to build great applications. Yeah, exactly right. Very much agree with that, Steve. So just with the, you know, the, the DeFi thing then, to me, it seems like, and you can't blame projects for doing this because obviously in, in 2020, you know, the one of the dominant narratives has been the rise of DeFi. And so look, you know, that's where a, a lot of the developers are focusing their energy at the moment. And of course, you know, the the traders and the speculators and there's there's just a lot happening there, right? That, that can't be denied. So of course it makes sense for, 
I guess, projects that are looking to gain traction to try and hitch their wagon, if you like, to DeFi. Uh, do you think that's uh, p- part of what's happening at the moment? Well, I think there's certainly an element that, um, you know, when a certain area uh, captures people's interest, um, there's a bunch of new entrants into into the space. I think that's, um, you know, that that's just sort of natural. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I think when I, I look at what we're trying to do at Algrand, um, it's really not necessarily a response to, to DeFi itself, although we think that that's uh, we would certainly like to see people building DeFi applications on Algorand, but it's really thinking about, you know, as people fill, build um, financial applications more broadly, whether it's uh, around in DeFi, whether it's more traditional payments or banking or lending applications, or even whether it's countries issuing, um, you know, national currencies, you know, what are what's the functionality they need? What does programmable money really need to look like? And what are some of the drawbacks um, that exist in some of the first generation platforms that are out there? And I think one of the things that we've really focused on uh, that's different from others is uh, creating a suite of primitives uh, in layer one that make it very easy for people to issue assets, make it very easy for people to exchange assets, um, and then smart contracts, uh, both stateless and stateful, i.e. the ability to run something once or have a long running application um, that allow people not only to construct what they need, but do it in a way um, that, that uh, also um, uh, allows them to benefit from the safety and security and performance um, of the underlying protocol uh, without you know a series of, of uh, drawbacks and I think if you look at one of the problems that's happened uh, as a result of DeFi and a lot of the smart contracts people have written is that you know, a tremendous amount of money has been lost or stolen uh, and there can be bugs especially security ones that, that contribute to that and having functionality be in layer one in the protocol uh, means that they're there you know anybody using our any of our primitives whether smart contracts um, or asset creation um, is benefiting from that the other uh, I think very important fact is that uh, all of the functionality that we uh, offer as part of the protocol runs at the full speed of the protocol. Um, and so when we think about smart contracts and atomic swaps and asset creation, really um, all of those things together, um, people can run uh, at kind of full speed and there's no performance penalty for doing that. So when you think about programmable money and financial products and how people exchange um, all sorts of different um you know, in all sorts of different ways, uh, we think that that's very, very important um, because as you start getting into hundreds of millions or billions of users, um, the speed that they're able to transact at is uh, is very important. And also as new users add to the system, it shouldn't um, cause the system to slow down. So those are the kinds of things that we think about. And, I, you know, I, I think some of them, um, you know, may not be immediately problematic uh, for people, but when you're talking to, you know, countries that have millions of citizens and are looking at national currencies, you know, these design choices, I think, become, um, you know, very important at scale uh, in a way that, that, you know, people are just starting to think about in, in the blockchain world. Yes, that's very much the case. And look, of course, so at the moment in, in DeFi, of course, everyone is building on Ethereum and and, and the, the background here or the context to that is that, of course, Ethereum is slowly moving to Ethereum 2.0 and the switch to a, a proof of stake consensus. And uh, so there's, you know, definitely a lot of ramifications for the Ethereum community going forward. But can you put you put Algorand I guess, in context as to where Ethereum is now and, you know, where Ethereum wants to get to with with ETH 2.0. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, do you see Algorand as potentially having, uh, I guess, better technology or a little bit of an advantage? And, you know, you talked about those design choices before and that you've been able to you know, learn from uh, the limitations of, uh, I guess, generation one blockchains, right? Yeah, well, I think, you know, part of it is, I think part of it was identifying um, where uh, the science needed to be improved. And I think that, you know, Silvio and the, you know, research team here have done, you know, a very good job on, on that front. I think more specifically, you know, if you look at, um, you know, Ethereum today, it supports around, uh, you know, don't quote me exactly, but I believe it's about 15 transactions a second. Um, 
you know, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, Bitcoin, it's a little bit slower. There's some other chains that are a little bit faster. Um, you know, Algorand today is around 1,100 transactions per second. Uh, we're going to be scaling that up to about 10,000 transactions a second um, over a couple of coming releases. So we feel good about the trajectory there. Um, you know, and I, I think one of the things that uh, we see as important is uh, understanding what people are using blockchains for and building some of that functional building functionality they need into a set of layer one primitives that make it very, very simple for them to use. Uh, and also, uh, by making it simple, also making it secure. I think if you look at Ethereum 2.0, obviously they're trying to solve for efficiency uh, and um, you know com com reducing computational requirements. We think that you know, that's certainly uh, a good goal. Uh, but I also think if, if you look at you know the way they've constructed their smart contracts, you know, they focused on you know general purpose, Turing complete smart contracts that are very flexible, but also create problems in terms of scalability, uh, security, and a variety of areas. Or at Algorand. Um, we focused a lot of attention on the layer one primitives um, that enable to people to do a variety of things um, that they commonly need as they build, um, you know, whether it's financial applications or, or rolling out programmable money um, or building dApps and embed that in layer one. Now, at the same time, um, we've, you know, also announced uh, a layer two smart contract platform where uh, the initiation of the contract will use our layer one uh, smart contracts, but then we'll run off chain so that, that so those applications in terms of size and scale aren't limited um, to a single block. And uh, we think that that's the right way to do that, run computation off chain, do it in a way that's provably honest, and then bring it back on chain. So again, I think there's there's simply some philosophical differences. You know, obviously, Ethereum has a great community, and we'll see how that evolves. Um, we think that there are a number of things that we are uniquely suited to address, especially high scale um, applications, um, which we're starting to see demand for. And so, you know, excited to continue to progress and see how people use the technology. Okay, well, let's talk about some of those use cases then, Steve. Just paint me a little a bit of a picture in terms of, you know, is there a a, a target market or a, or, or a, like a, a, an initial customer profile for Algorand? Like, do you see yourself as building uh, a, a chain for enterprise use or individual developers or, you know, ev everyone is welcome? What are the kind of the, the first primary use cases that you're targeting? Well, I think, first of all, uh, you know, Algorand is a permissionless platform. Certainly everyone is welcome and, and uh, you know, we'd like to see people using it uh, for anything they, uh, they, they um, see fit for. You know, that sure. said, uh, I think, it, again, you know, going, going back to the layer one philosophy and the, the benefits of our pure proof of stake approach, uh, I think lend themselves naturally toward, um, you know, uh, different forms of, of financial applications. And, you know, sort of the few that we focused on initially um, are, you know, DeFi, um, certainly uh, focus on people bringing assets on. Uh, we have both USDC and USDT on chain natively uh, and are seeing many people starting to build interesting DeFi applications um, with the, the primitives and smart contracts uh, that we have. So excited about that. Um, the second is more traditional uh, payment networks and uh, banks uh, who are looking either to create their own assets, tokenize um, different financial products that may be existing today, um, or even looking at you know how they may handle things like post trade settlement and settlement of uh, you know across different networks. So we see some really interesting activity there, and and then the third uh, is uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, we recently uh, announced that the Marshall Islands is deploying their national currency on Algorand, uh, and we have you know a number of others uh, that, that we're in discussions with. So we think that that's um, really a, a venue that, that takes advantage of the technology very well. And so I, I think certainly there's a bit of a financial flavor to the way we've seen people um, taking advantage of the tech, but you know certainly not limited to that either. And I mean, speaking of central bank digital currencies, uh, do you follow that? space uh, yourself you know there's obviously uh, bubblings of, of what's happening in, in China and I think they have little you know various blockchain trials in, in different parts of China and, and all the, the different uh, central banks around the world are 
obviously looking at this space, but you know, I don't think any of them are, are, are close to deploying anything. Uh, but what's your take on on the central bank digital currency model? Well, I think it's it's not you know that different uh, from what we've seen out in the market than you know you would see in in kind of a startup world where I think you know some of the smaller countries are able to be more nimble and, and move more quickly. Uh, we're definitely seeing um, some aggressive signs there. Uh, I also think that China has really um, led a number of countries to take pause uh, and think about that. I, I think from our perspective, China sees um, a central bank digital currency as a way to um, increase China's China's prominence in terms of you know the rest of the world um, using their country or using their currency. Um, uh, and I think that that's that's definitely been an eye opener um, for many bigger countries uh, and small ones. And so I think that they're really acting as a catalyst uh, to drive interest. And you know we're seeing uh, accelerated interest in um, the digital dollar, where there's you know, different projects going on. Um, you know, and and you know many other countries as well. So I think you know while the Marshall Islands was really one of the first, I, I think um, you know. You could expect to see, you know, several others uh, start to emerge in addition to China, and I think China is probably closer um, to actually, you know, bringing something to market than than people realize. Yeah, I, I do too. I think uh, when it happens, though, they'll, they'll, they'll just do it. But well, what's the the Marshall Islands one that you mentioned that is on Algorand? Um, yeah, what's what's the idea there? Is it is it more of a trial, or or is it uh, yeah a- actually being used? Uh, it's on the trial. It's in the process of being launched, and uh, it is you know it'll be their their sovereign currency. Uh, they're calling the Sov, um, and uh, you know I think from the Marshall Islands perspective, I think they've looked at what some other financial centers or countries that have focused on being financial centers, like the Cayman Islands, have done, and I think they feel there's an opportunity um, to really get a foothold in the you know digital currency and crypto space. And um, you know, I think by leading out with a, a national currency, they could put themselves in an interesting position. So we'll see how it goes. But definitely excited that they chose Algorand as a technology, and um, you know, uh, we hope that uh, that it's a big success for them. Yeah, well, look, uh, I do too, and that'll be fascinating to watch. And look, you know, we talked about this idea of the Algorand ecosystem, and so you know, there's. As you say, it's a it's a permissionless blockchain. Anyone can come and build. But I understand that there are you know in the region of four hundred companies that are effectively building on Algorand or you know trying to build out the ecosystem. So yeah, talk me through any other uh, high profile examples. And you know, is that right? Are there really four hundred different companies uh, deploying projects on Algorand? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have a lot of support um, in the ecosystem. We're really excited about some of the applications people are, are both developing and deploying. Um, you know, a, a couple that I mentioned, so Tether and USDC are both deployed and live on chain. Uh, we think that that's a, a key ingredient for DeFi, DeFi applications that, you know, stable coins help, help drive uh, applications that people are building. Uh, in terms of, you know, interesting use cases, I can just talk about a few recent launches. Uh, Props is one. Um, you know, Props has uh, migrated about 5 million users to Algorand. They were, you know, previously running on a uh, Hyperledger, so a permissioned uh, network, and you know didn't really w- were wanted to be deployed in a public network, um, but, but you know couldn't really find one with technology that they liked and could support their scale, um, and you know they're growing very very quickly. So you know I think we're excited to see both you know transactional volume, uh, you know the use of our uh, ASA standard asset framework, and you know a, a, an interesting DApp and it Props is a, a loyalty system, um, so people can earn tokens by using um, different applications online. Uh, but rather than those loyalty points being tied, you know, to a specific vendor, they can you know broadly be used as money and and you know really represent kind of a share of of uh, kind of the network. And so I think that's a, a really cool example of a, a use case where you know their users are excited to use uh, excited to use their their application um, and excited to be part of the props platform, um, but largely are are new to crypto. Um, they weren't because those are people who are are really are exposed to props through kind of other underlying applications that have subscribed um, to the props ecosystem. So I think it's a it's a very cool um, use case. Um, obviously, it's you know it has a, a little bit of a, a financial flavor in terms of uh, in terms of loyalty points and and you know earning money for using applications. 
You know, another one that's a slightly different uh, use case is uh, Planet Watch. Uh, they've deployed recently as well. Uh, what Planet Watch does is they have sensors that people have in people's homes or businesses uh, in different parts of the world. And, you know, their goal is to effectively um, capture uh, air quality data um, in as many places as they can and then compare that to what the governments are claiming air quality data is. Um, and I think as you know, the world more moves towards more strict carbon regulations uh, and carbon credit system, they're, you know, they're very passionate about making sure that um, people aren't misrepresenting uh, you know, air quality in, in their um, cities or countries. And, uh, and so those, uh, those sensors are automatically um, posting results of the blockchain and then uh, Planet Watch aggregates them. So, you know, again, I think, very, you know, very interesting, um, you know, very interesting application where they're collecting, you know, millions of data points every day and then posting that onto, onto um, you know, Algorand through a series of transactions. Fascinating. I, I love that. That sounds uh, very intriguing. Well, so if you've, you've got 400 odd companies already deploying on Algorand, so, you know, how, what are you doing to facilitate this? You know, do what's your go-to-market strategy? Uh, you know, because there's, there's almost a, there's kind of a, a divide in, in blockchain or, or in DeFi at the moment. You know, there's, on the one hand, there's, you know, VC-backed projects with, uh, you know, a, a lot of funds and there's often a pre-mine and, you know, there's a token and, and the VCs have a lot of them. And then there the, are the more decentralized projects where, you know, the users are demanding tokens with, you know, governance and revenue rights and, and no pre-mine. So how would you characterize Algorand uh, in that context, and, and what's your go-to market strategy to uh, to attract both developers and projects? What are the developer incentives? Yeah, sure. Well, so you know, a few different things uh, there. I mean, certainly we you know we did raise money uh, prior to launch. Um, you know, at the same time, I think if you look at a lot of projects, they sort of materially sold all of the tokens pre-launch, um, which wasn't really uh, wasn't really the goal of, of Algorand. Um, you know, having the network decentralized over time is, is something that's uh, you know definitely a focus of the Algorand Foundation. And I, I guess there's sort of a couple of different things. Um, you know, one, um, I'd say we uh, find that. That we're sort of approached and also we have um, you know folks from the solutions team that are sort of in the market uh, and developer relations folks that are in the market kind of helping developers you know helping create materials how to's guides and you know really looking at it from both kind of top down and you know bottoms up just understanding you know what things people are working on but at the same time uh, we see a lot of people innovating um, that may need support for uh, the applications they want to build mm -hmm. and so the Algorand foundation is is you know very aggressive um, issuing grants to to developers or to projects um, that are interested in launching uh, on Algorand. So, um, you know, definitely we're sort of out there trying to support the market in, uh, in as many different ways as we can. And, um, you know, also make sure not only that we're supporting with time, but that we're creating the right tools and materials that people need um, so that they can get their work done. And, you know, I, I think so far, um, you know, we're really excited about, uh, about both the diversity and the number of projects that uh, are looking at the technology. And look, you mentioned, Steve, the Algorand Foundation, so probably good to just understand the, the distinction between the Algorand Foundation and, I, I guess, Algorand, the company, or... Yeah, how, how does how does uh, you know the the company that I manage, Algorand Inc, is a U.S. based company. Um, that's where you know Silvio and I sit, and uh, really focused on continued research and uh, development and engineering uh, around kind of building uh, both tools and technology uh, around the public network. And so if, if you look at um, the protocol release uh, was released into the public uh, originally in June of 2019. Um, there was a major upgrade to Algorand 2.0 in November of last year that brought uh, Algorand standard assets, uh, brought layer one smart contracts and, and you know, a series of other uh, other you know, sort of critical features that, that um, we felt would be helpful in the market. Uh, and then, you know, most recently, uh, actually just about a, a week ago or, or a couple of weeks ago, uh, Algorand 3.0 launched, um, which included stateful smart contracts in layer one, um, 
uh, things like rekeying, which is the ability to keep your public key but change your private keys, um, so that uh, for security reasons, people can have still have long running accounts uh, that make it easy for application developers. The program as a company continues to to work on technology, and um, you know we're excited to see a lot of other people in the ecosystem um, building around Algorand and and. Um, you know, hope that uh, they certainly dwarf what we're doing uh, over the coming uh, coming years. The Algorand Foundation is really focused on uh, governance of the network, uh, decentralization, um, encouraging developers to build, building community. Uh, they have over 400 ambassadors worldwide uh, that you know help spread the word around Algorand, um, and you know look at you know many many. Uh, grant proposals, uh, people looking to build on the platform. So you know, it's uh, definitely more of a mission around community building and governance, um, you know, versus ours, which is really about technology and, and, you know, continued research and innovation. Super. And what about the Algorand token, Algo? So where, where does Algo fit in to the Algorand ecosystem? What's the, just the, the high level tokenomics, I guess? Yeah, sure. So the, the simple version is, you know, the algo is the, you know, prime asset of the public network. Uh, the algo is what's used um, to pay transaction fees, uh, to run smart contracts, uh, and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, in addition, the algo, uh, you know, part of the pure proof of stake protocol is that every token holder um, can be called on at any time to propose a block. Um, and uh, both the algos are used um, for that purpose, but also uh, algos most uh, every token holder needs to vote on upgrades to the protocol, and so the algo is really a governance token as well. So the algo serves several different roles um, within the ecosystem, and uh, you know as the platform continues to grow, uh, I think there'll be more reasons for for more people to to hold algos um, there. But its um, its primary role is one to kind of secure the network, um, help. Provide a way for people to participate in consensus, uh, and also serve as a way for people to pay fees um, for the different facilities that exist. Super. And look, I, I noticed. I know this is uh, this is from earlier in the year. I think this was back in June. This was this was announced, but I I did come across it again. I, I understand that um, Silvio he did some work with Mani Bali from Blockstack. And uh, and they have created a kind of what is it like an open source project to develop a new smart contract language, and that's called Clarity, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's actually one of the things we didn't talk about. Is um, you know our our point of view is that um, you know there'll certainly be different blockchains uh, that are broadly used for different purposes, um, but that you know there needs to be more interoperability um you know one form of interoperability could be token bridges and the ability to move assets back and forth um another one that we think is very important is really simplifying um, how people write smart contracts in the first place and so clarity is a uh, a smart contract language uh and using clarity you'll be able to um, both deploy smart contracts onto Blockstack, um, but also um, onto algorand using um, the layer two smart contract um, platform that we announced uh, announced recently, and so really excited about that collaboration, and, and we hope other uh, projects um, choose to adopt Clarity as well. Um, both Algorand and Blockstack uh, contribute engineering resources um, and, uh, and and collaborate on uh, on that project. Oh, nice, nice, and and look, you know, Blockstack is another one of these projects that has, um, you know, I think really impressive uh, tech and uh, you know some 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 impressive uh, computer science guys behind the project, right? Yeah, for sure. I, we have a ton of respect for them, and and I think that whole team is um, is really top notch. Uh, and I think more than anything else, we saw there was a lot of philosophical similarities in terms of the way we were thinking about um, smart contracts and what a programming language should look like, um, especially a focus on simple. Uh, as we bring more developers in, you know, we need just blockchains to be much, much easier uh, to develop develop on and uh, build applications for it. So uh, I think we found that, you know, definitely they have a lot of similar ideas and, and you know, really excited to be working with, with them on it. Super, super. All right. Well, just before we go to a, a break, why don't we just uh, finish off on, on Algorand? Uh, why don't you just... Uh, you know, we're sort of coming up to the end of quite a crazy year, but um, yeah, what's what's on your immediate to-do list or or your roadmap? What's happening uh, in in the immediate short term that's exciting? Yeah, well, we're excited. I mean, uh, you know, I I think um, 
as is the case almost always at Al Grand, we have more interesting technology to come than than uh, uh, what's you know been delivered so far. Um, and I think you know on that front, you know I mentioned a few of them earlier. Um, the one is you know we're expecting a order of magnitude improvement in uh, performance. Um, that's being worked on right now, and and uh, you know people will see that uh, probably toward the end of the year, maybe early next year. Um, in you know, the second is uh, we have a big push around interoperability. Um, you know, clarity and smart contracts is one way, um, but we've been working on some really exciting tech um, for token bridging uh, and allowing people to have permissionless token bridges, uh, which would be new in the market, um, and we'll be sharing more about that soon. And uh, and then you know beyond that, I, I think that there's um, you know really a uh, a need for kind of more tools and simplicity uh, and so we're going to continue to push out uh, we think really great developer tools and uh, continue adding to uh, um, you know the, the developer sites and and um, you know expressing how to use features for people um, especially things like on-chain liquidity and others that you know DeFi applications need so um, you know, there's a whole bunch uh, that uh, we're working on. And, you know, I think everyone should stay tuned if, uh, if they're interested in seeing what comes out. All right. Well, we will indeed stay tuned, Steve. And listeners, please also stay tuned. We're going to go for a very quick break, but we'll be right back to finish off with the very famous Crypto Conversation Hot Take Ground. Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins liquid indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. All right, we're back, and I am with Steve Kokinos. He is the CEO at Algorand. Now, Steve, I like to finish each podcast with a very quick round of crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Yeah, let's do it. All right, I just want your hot takes, your hot fire. Take your best shot. Here we go, Steve. Where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? Well, uh, you know, since I, I guess I voted with, uh, you know, the project I'm involved with, um, you know, we definitely think that it very much think it's going to be a multi-chain world. Um, clearly, Bitcoin has established itself uh, as a very unique asset in the world. And we think that Bitcoin um, will be very prominent, uh, you know, for the long run. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that, you know, the idea that um, any one technology uh, or platform will be the only one um, you know, I think seems to sort of butt heads with, with history where I think every previous tech wave we've really seen kind of a, a series of technologies that, that get um, employed for different purposes and you know ultimately lead to a, a successful ecosystem and uh, we believe strongly that something like that will happen here. I think you are probably quite correct Steve. All right but what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion? I think probably the biggest one uh, for me is is I think programmable money is is going to make people wonder you know how on earth the world worked before, um, you know just like I think it's hard for my kids to you know think about what the world would have been like without the internet. Um, I think you know once we really start to see some great applications come out, uh, people are going to wonder how we lived without uh, you know blockchain systems. I love it. I think you're right again, Steve. All right, let's switch it up. You're an American. Who wins the American presidential election 2020? What do you think? I'm pretty sure it's going to be a white man in his 70s. <laughs> That's an excellent answer. And look, you're probably correct. <laughs> Speaking of white men in their 70s, um, Bill Gates, he famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So, you know, cast your mind forward. What, what does blockchain look like in 10 years time? Yeah, I think that's a, you know, that's a good question. And it's something that we, we think a lot about, um, you know, and I, I definitely am somebody who likes to use history as a, a guide. Um, you know, if you go back 20 years ago and, and look at the internet, um, you know, people are saying, geez, I, why should I shop online? You know, why on earth would I watch a movie on my computer? That doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, and, and obviously the world has, has changed. 
Um, and on the one hand, you know, I think the base, the sort of underlying infrastructure of the internet is, you know, it's much more robust, robust and faster than it was. But you know, overall, pretty similar. Um, but really, it's the applications that are vastly, vastly different than uh, than they were at launch. Uh, and it would have been hard to imagine, you know, where we'd end up today. Um, I think in the, the same, you know, sort of the same way, uh, or sort of a, a similar trajectory seems to be playing out um, for the blockchain space. And I think 10 years from now, public blockchains will be a utility uh, like the internet or electricity or running water, which is something that people just expect uh, to work. Um, but I, I think the applications are going to be you know, vastly more sophisticated and, and just make people's lives easier in, in so many different ways uh, where they transact and it's you know, very cumbersome and complicated right now. No doubt, no doubt. All right, well, Steve, uh, William Gibson, a famous sci-fi author, you will have heard this quote, but he, of course, said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people just aren't really aware of it? Yeah, I mean, go. you know, again, uh, it, you know, I think the internet was one step, you know, mobile devices was, was another. Um, you don't have to go back very far to where, you know, virtually nobody had cell phones and nobody had smartphones, um, you know, but they could text, they could do certain things. And so I, I think that, you know, some of the people who were early adopters of even, you know, so let's say text messaging uh, in the, you know, kind of beginning days of, of, you know, cell phones and the early, early days of smartphones, um, you know, the, the raw ingredients were there, um, but a lot of people didn't know about it. A lot of people didn't know why they would want to use it. And so I, I think that, that um, we see lots of examples of, uh, of that out there. So it's, um, you know, I, uh, I think it's not necessarily the first applications uh, that become the ones uh, that everybody uses. Uh, it, you know, I think often it's really the second wave uh, where people start to get the user experiences right and make it simpler for people. Yeah, I, I agree. It really is uh, often about user experience and uh, just making it seamless and easy and, and abstract all the hard stuff away. But all right, time to get slightly weird, Steve. Let's zoom out. What do you see as the long term future for the human race? Uh, do you see dystopia or utopia? Well, um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I think I'm an optimist at heart. I think you sort of have to be. Um, and, but, you know, I think if you take a step back, it's obviously, I mean, a crazy world right now uh, in so many different ways. Uh, we could have a long discussion on, on that. Um, but I think if you take a step back and you look over longer arcs of time, you know, the world's a much better place today than it, than it ever has been. Um, you know, think about 100 years ago when the Spanish flu hit, you know, there was no power prospect of vaccines or treatments. People just had to do the best they could and ride it out. Um, we're likely to have a vaccine available, you know, at least to uh, frontline workers and people at high risk in, in what, a year, less than a year, a little bit maybe, um, and probably broadly available shortly after. So I think something like that would have been unthinkable, you know, even a hundred years ago, let alone if you go back further. So I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic on, in terms of where the world's going. Yeah, look, I, I think so too. And of course, that's the that's the Steven Pinker argument, isn't it? And of course, you know, it's yeah, it's hard to argue with that. hundred years ago, yeah, life was, uh, what, nasty, brutal and short, as people like to say. Uh, <laughs> and look, here we are now in 2020. We're not quite uh, immortal, but, you know, give it another hundred years or so and, and it feels like that could start to be on the table. Uh, which kind of relates to the final question, Steve, which is... What is your favorite science fiction book, film, show, or universe? Oh, this is a tough question, but um, I think for sure, uh, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is my yes. favorite sci-fi piece. Uh, I've actually uh, been asked this one before, and that's, uh, I think that's the best answer I can give. I think if you, for anyone who hasn't read it, I highly recommend it. It was prescient in so many ways from the internet to virtual reality to digital currency and uh, I think is just as relevant today as, as it was you know, 20 years ago. Yeah, it, it really is a, a superb book by a very influential author. Have you read his, um, what is it called, uh, Cryptonomicon? I have read that uh, and I just recently read uh, Seven Eves. Um, I have to say some of his later books are pretty long, so uh, yeah, it yeah. took me an awful long time to get through, but um, he's definitely a, a unique writer. 
yeah, crypto, Cryptonomicon, I think I read that in the late 90s, but I just remember that being an absolute beast of a book and a, <laughs> a bit of a mission to get through, if I'm honest. But yeah, yeah, enjoyable stuff. Look, uh, fantastic to talk to you today, Steve. Thank you very much for your time. Nothing else to say, really, except uh, to pass the microphone back to you. Please tell the people where they can go to find you on your various platforms and, and where they should go to really dig into Algorand. And, and what you guys are building. Yeah, so, um, you know, please uh, you come check us out. You can learn more about the technology at, at uh, algorand.com. Um, the Algorand Foundation is algorand.foundation. Uh, learn more about sort of governance and the grant, uh, the grant project or uh, grant program. And uh, for anyone looking to build uh, on top of Algorand, uh, developer.algorand.org is where um, all of our how-tos and guides and developer tools, uh, SDKs, and, and everything else you need to get started. Um, so, you know, please come check us out and, uh, you know, reach out to us anytime. Fantastic. Hey, thank you very much, Steve. All the best. Andy, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I hope to talk again soon. All right. Bye for now.